Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Claudia Salm. Claudia is the Director of Macroeconomic Policy at Equitable Growth and formerly was at the Board of Governors as a Section Chief in the Consumer Community Affairs Division, as well as serving on the Staff Macro Forecast. Claudia specializes in macroeconomics and household finance and joins us today to discuss some of her work. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you on. We have been uh, Twitter friends for a long time. Mm -hmm. been trying to get you on the show, so finally you have arrived. So, uh, Glad to get you on board. Now, you've had an exciting career. You've worked at the Board of Governors for mm -hmm. 12, 12 years. 12 years. 12 years. So you've been inside the belly of the beast. You've seen it all. You've probably have chuckled a few times when those of us on the outside make our comments about the <laughs> things going on. Mm -hmm. You're probably smirking. Maybe sometimes you're you know gritting your teeth at us. But here we are. You've now joined us on the outside. You're a director at the Macroeconomic Policy part mm -hmm. of Equitable Growth. This is exciting. But I want to begin the show by asking, how did you get into economics? What made you choose this path for a career? Mm -hmm. Well, so I'll say I went to undergrad. So I went to Denison University. Okay. And before I started, I really thought I'd be an English major. So that was in my head. And sometime before I went to actually sign up for classes and like summer orientation, I was like, nah, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to study what people wrote a long time ago. So when I signed up for my classes, I took an economics, a political science, a German, and then like a third year math class. It so turned out that I had a triple major in economics, political science, and German. And wow. I figure after doing an economics PhD, I basically picked up the math. It would have been good to have done an undergrad, not at night after being a research assistant. And, and first of all, I mean, I am a very liberal arts person. Like I love economics, but I appreciate the political economy aspect. Yep. And the education I got at Denison was unlike what I got when I went to Michigan, which great education at Michigan. I had my advisor, Sarah Bedad, who was excellent. He was actually my first economics professor and gave me a lot of positive feedback on how like I was doing in economics. So I think that matters. And there's research that shows that matters, especially for women students. Uh, I mean, I got really good grades, too. So I had affirmation in different places. Uh, and he was a Marxist. Like oh, That really? is his background. He had training that was more traditional at yeah. Michigan State. Uh, he was from Iran, went back, then had to leave when the politics turned against. And he was my thesis advisor. And I wrote a thesis. I was very interested in what was happening in the eastern part of Europe, uh, I mean, I was I graduated uh, in 1998, so it was well past you know the wall coming down in '89. Uh, but I was very interested in the economic transition and him being who he is. He said, "Well, you're going to go back and study the formation of capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, and then you'll read Marx." And then, so I spent a year reading a lot of history of economic thought. My uh, Thesis, I like to impress Brad DeLong with the fact that I actually have read up on history, and I did a lot of it. It was a really interesting project. After I graduated from Denison, I went to Germany and spent a year at, in Dresden at the Technical University, and I was studying economics. And there I was really interested in the transformation, a little more okay. modern day. Uh, living in Germany for a year, I definitely saw that. Uh, my husband, well, actually, it was right before we married. We're now co-parents, but he's from Dresden. And I mean, okay. I, you know, love German and uh, Germany. Uh, and so I did a Fulbright. And I will say that year was the closest I came to not becoming an economist. I, I thought I'd learn about East Germany. What I did come to understand is the East German economics professors were some of the first to lose their job after the wall came down. In many ways, this makes sense. They were very tied to the socialist government. It yep. was time for a change. The professors who were there were West German. Mainly, they just came in for some classes during the week and went back home. There was no, there was nothing in the instruction that focused on East Germany and its transformation. And I can remember I took their master's level courses. I was in a class that was game theory. It was all in German. 
I mean, it's not hard. It wasn't hard for me to find game theory textbooks and like I can do the little trees and whatever. Uh, So I got through the class, but I was just like, this is not the economics that I was taught and fell in love with. This isn't policy. This is like, what is this? So when I was coming back to the United States, I had another professor at Denison, Dick Lucier, who had spent a year at the Brookings Institution. And he told me, he's like, and I was really fishing around and like applying to HR jobs. I just didn't know what I was going to do. And he said, you should apply to be a research assistant at Brookings. He said, that's a great place. It'd be a great experience for you. That was the only research assistant application I put in because I really didn't un- – like this was not something I'd been exposed to. I was very fortunate. I was hired. Barry Bosworth and Gary Burtless were my senior fellows. Oh, nice. They're amazing. They're, they've been extremely good mentors. So I – they hired me. That was an amazing year. That got me totally back. I want to be an economist. Love economics again. They had me co-author on a paper towards Great. the end. And what I realized is I could do a lot – very empirical, work hard. But I got to a place where I couldn't contribute. Like there were aspects of the theory Mm. and building the macro model. And so I knew I needed to go to graduate school. So I went with a purpose. And that's I found that very important to get through the first year, which reminded me a lot of German. It's very technical and theoretical. Uh, Michigan has a strong applied macro program. I did macro and labor as a field. Obviously, labor, they have excellent uh, applied labor folks. And Matthew Shapiro is my advisor at Michigan, again, an excellent mentor. So I had a whole string of professors and senior fellows at Brookings who were incredible mentors. I never had a woman economist as a mentor until huh. uh, I was years into the Fed. So I, I really feel like you can be a good mentor and an ally regardless of whether on some demographic dimension or life experience dimension, you match up. For those out there who have the opportunity to mentor, do it, take advantage of it. And you yourself are doing this. I, I've seen this evidenced on Twitter of all places, but you have taken it upon yourself to go above and beyond what you have to do at work, at home, you've got children, <laughs> that you go and you read job market candidates, their papers. So these are you know, freshly minted PhDs right now on the job market. They're all getting nervous because you know, this is the time of year when you hope and you pray you get some interviews and, and you're helping them. You're taking time out to advise them on their papers, give them advice. So that's great. That's great that you're doing it. And I know a number of listeners on the show are grad students. They've, they've come and talked to me. So I'm, I'll say on their behalf, thank you, Claudia, for, for doing that. But any uh, any advice you would give them? Because you've been many years inside the Federal Reserve, so some of them might be headed there. Or you've been inside the other government agencies. You've, you've toured those as well. And now you're coming outside. Any career advice you would give a freshly minted PhD? So I think especially those who are getting ready to do their interviews, uh, the annual meetings, have an open mind about what comes next in your career. Uh, When I was applying for jobs, and so I told my advisor, Matthew Shapiro, I'm not going to apply to the board. There was something about going to the board that reminded me of the never-ending macro seminar. Like, I loved macro. That seminar was a little different than the labor seminar. And I was just like, this is a pretty heavy dose of macro economists. And the Michigan sent a lot of people to the board, and my advisor in particular. And I'm kind of one of these, like, I kind of, I like to be the odd duck and do something different. Those who follow me on Twitter know this, and my colleagues at the board. Uh, So I wasn't going to apply. And Matthew looked at me and he's like, you are going to apply to the board. You are a – you will be a perfect board economist. I was like, OK. So I applied. So I think that's this open-mindedness. You don't – So cast your net wide. Yeah. But, and know. even when you go to think about jobs you accept, pay a lot of attention to the department. I had some flyouts where it was really clear early on that it was a viper's nest. Like there, and yeah. this happens with faculty. Like somebody has a favorite person, someone has another favorite oh, person. Exactly, the worst at times. And, yeah. and if you can see, and that should be in the faculty meetings when they go to vote. When you can yep. see that in your job talk, that is a huge red flag. And I also had a university where, in one of my office visits, the faculty member badmouthed their grad students. Like not oh, wow. being high enough quality. And I'm like, I am out of here. Like I almost tried to cancel the right. dinner because I'm like, I'd rather go home and sleep. Uh, so pay attention to that. I had a colleague when I started the board and she's like, well, this is the best job I got, best offer. And I'm like, well, frankly, that's for all of us, right? <laughs> we go where it's the best. But best has a lot of dimensions to it. And it's yep. feeling like you fit. It fits your life. You think there are colleagues there 
more than one that you'd be close with. I mean, every department's got a jerk in it, you know, and you can stay away from them. Several. Yeah. Um, So ask, ask the students, ask the faculty, what's it like to be here? And think about government, private sector, and academia. I think some students, unfortunately, have advisors and committees that are maybe not to a fault of their, themselves, but they try to create little mini-me's. So for them, it's the academic placement. That's what you should go for. That was not the mentoring I got at Michigan. But even when I was choosing between jobs at the board and I had some options, I was like, you want me to be a macro forecaster? I mean, that wasn't my research, and I couldn't see it. But the people who were hiring me, they could see it. So sometimes you don't even know where you fit best, and you got to be open-minded. So I think that's that. My other big advice is be kind to your peers. Like, this is a high-anxiety time. Economists with PhDs are highly employable, especially if they keep an open mind about where they could go. First step, it's not like it's a job for life. You can go to another job. Uh, But it's a really high-stress time, and it's important to find ways to both reduce the anxiety in your own life – Like, stay off that job market rumors blog because that is only anxiety. That was my first year on the market, and it created more anxiety for me. Like, you don't want to see who got the offer at the place you were really gunning for. So find ways to keep your anxiety level low and be kind to your classmates. And I will say, you mentioned this. I've been reading these job market papers, which has been so much fun. Like, I don't read widely in macro anymore because I read – for my research papers, things that we need to cite and be aware of. So I work in a lot of consumer consumption behavior. I mean, I've read so many rejections of the permanent income hypothesis. I'm just like, this is great. Anyways, and I read my referee reports. So again, that ties back to my research. I don't have a lot of time to read widely. I do research. When I have research time, I'm writing my research. Like, anyway, so what I realized, I had asked for all job market papers and macro and I had so much fun because I was reading really widely in macro. And what I had offered them is I'd read the abstract, the introduction, all their tables and charts. Because I believe communication is extremely important. And one of my jobs as a section chief the last two years was to read the papers of my economists. I have to sign off on them before they become Fed's working papers. And I had early career researchers, actually, frankly, some that were further along, who their introductions weren't good. The the technical part of their paper was so sound. And I said, you know, as a referee, if I'm falling asleep on page five, this is not going to help you. And they were getting desk rejects on some papers. And I'm like, this is your problem. So I had one person who he's like, you've made me revise it like 12 times. I'm like, yeah, you're going to do 13. Like it's (laughs) you're getting close. But um, so I realized this was uh, a gap in a lot of economists uh, education And so I wanted to help these job market candidates give them tips. I had – so like I said, I had no idea how much fun it would be. I underestimated that. Second, I had no idea how bad the writing would be. And I read papers from MIT, Stockholm, India, UC, you know, the California – I mean, I read them from all over and they were all bad. Like the core of their papers were amazing And they would hide things like their contribution to economics and like the fifth sentence of a 10 paragraph or a 10 sentence paragraph. And I was like, no. So I felt like I had really contributed to them. They were all very thankful when they asked me as a group, like, what can we do to like pay this back? And I was like, you can be kind to your classmates on the job market. So, uh, so that was a great experience. I think for mentoring and doing work like this, I spend a lot of time on Twitter talking about why I think diversity and inclusion and economics is so important on a lot of dimensions, but on one important dimension for the economics and the policy advice. And then I thought, you know, I got to put my money where my mouth is. Time is our greatest asset. So I was like, ah, I'll do this. Well, that's very nice of you to do that. And I'm sure they appreciate it. And, I, and I've heard before, too, economists sometimes aren't good communicators, <laughs> And, and that's, that's a big part of the battle, right? It, it, the messenger might destroy the message in the way they bring the message to the public. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit okay. more about the Fed and then move on to some of your research. So I'm just curious, like working at the Fed, did you, you know, run into Jay Powell and all, hey, Jay, how, how's it going? Or, you know, hey, uh, Leo, what's up? You know, I mean, is it that kind of <laughs> casual? Or when you meet him, it's like, yes, Governor, you know, Brainerd. I mean, how, how, how what was, what was a typical day like? 
at the Board of Governors. Yeah, so that typical day has changed over time. I mean, uh-huh. I've been there 12 years, and I've seen a change in our culture. That was an intentional change from the very top. Uh, and I think that's good. So, but I came in my first year, my first forecast at the board was in January of 2008. Wow. And I, fo- I followed consumer spending. My first year, I did it. Uh, and I did, I did well. But it was a mixture of imposter syndrome, all of our models broke, stress does not bring out the best in people. And, I'm an emotional person, and watching that data come in and how it was hurting people and how it was rough, huh? we could – I mean, the Fed was trying – and they were being super creative, and it just – it was bad. So for me on a lot of levels, that was a really tough introduction to the Fed. I came in – Bernanke had not been there that long when I came in. There was a aura – of Alan Greenspan at the Fed. So I think in I started in the 2000, summer of 2007. I had some research time, was kind of watching things start to move around in the economy. But I decided I need to read Greenspan's memoir because I got to figure out what this is here. I made it through. I made through more of that than I made through Bernanke's memoir. Uh, that's another story. So uh, and it was much the culture was a lot more buttoned down. And Bernanke wanted to much more structured and strict and formal. Bernanke wanted to change that, but he just, what he stepped into, we didn't need to like ease up. It was just, we just needed to hold on and do the work. Uh, So I was trained and there's a lot of training. Like we go to briefer school before we're allowed to do a briefing in the boardroom as a staff person. We go to a week long school. We learn how to write the briefings. We are videotaped talking, and then we do a mock briefing in the boardroom, which in some ways is scary because these are our senior colleagues, and that's the first time you sit in there. Anyway, so there's a lot of training. That training goes on. When I did it, it was formal because at that point, the staff briefings, and we do them data briefings, and then before the FOMC meeting, there's a briefing, and you have to be more experienced to do the more important ones. And they're written prepared text. We have a meeting where we edit as a group, and go line by line, word by word. Sounds I mean, painful. <laughs> words, but you learn something. Like I have the Fed decoder ring now. Like I know what words mean. And a lot of the words sound like people words, but they have a quantitative meaning. Okay. So anyway, so when I started, it was chairman this, governor that. And actually some of the most obnoxious things that were said to me and hoops I had to jump through it would be somebody in my office saying, the chairman wants this. The chairman wants that. The chairman doesn't care about your research, doesn't care about what you think about monetary policy. <laughs> Anyways, um, and those were not pleasant experiences. I actually, there was a, a set of them that were really unpleasant and early in my career before I knew how to tell people get out of my office, like you're being unfair and unkind. Uh, and I actually had a set of them because I had emailed Ben Bernanke because the American Economics Association is doing a lot. They put out yeah. a harassment policy and I sent it around at the board My because co- I think it's really important. And I, especially to my team, I wanted to emphasize like this is a real thing. And so I emailed him to be like, this is the email I sent around to my staff. I'm so happy you're doing this. And I said, it's so important because I had these experiences and I shared some of the things like in his, not his name, but in his title. Mm -hmm. And I told him, it's like, I knew you didn't initiate that. But I also knew if I caught you in the elevator, which I mean, we'd see him and sometimes he'd sit at lunch with us. If I'd asked you if he'd done, like the boom would have come down, not from him, but like, so that just wasn't allowed. And that's fine. I knew, but he confirmed in this email. He's like, I didn't, I didn't start any of that. And I was like, I know, but like, I got yelled at mul- or scolded multiple times after I walked out of his office in some kind of a staff because I didn't use the right words. Or I got a little too feisty. But you're saying it got better over time. I got better at handling it. You got better. <laughs> okay. And I think broadly the culture has gotten better. I think we're still yeah. very hard on new people, mainly because, I mean, a research assistant hadn't gone to econ PhD. Like they have not right. chosen to be in our culture. I like how economists are direct and we fix problems and work. I think yeah. there's a difference between being critical and direct and being 
undercutting someone and trying to make them feel bad. And um, anyway, so I think it's gotten better, but it's gotten better because, and I am not alone in it, this is because there are many staff and leaders of the board who have put a priority on, we're going to fix this. Fix the so, culture of the Fed. Yeah. It, well, well, good for you. And you, you put forth some uh, effort toward that. Um, lots of war stories I'm sure you yeah. could, could tell. <laughs> Maybe we should have another whole episode on yeah. that. Of course, you know, I'm sure maybe you want to keep some things close to your chest. Let's talk about some of your work because you've kind of mm-hmm. uh, done some things that are pretty fascinating. And I want to go to something that I would think is probably something you've received the most notice, recognition for, especially lately, and that's called the Psalm Rule. So that's your last name, Psalm Rule. And this is something that you wrote as as part of an, an article for the book Recession Ready. Um, the article was titled "Direct Stimulus Payment to Individuals," mm-hmm. and it's it's a rule. We'll get into what the rule is, but before we do that and explain what this rule is, I just want to explain to our listeners, those who aren't in this econ world, to have a rule named after you is is a pretty big feat, a pretty big accomplishment. So just by comparison, there's a famous economist named John Taylor, and there's a rule called the Taylor Rule, which is huge in macroeconomics. And most central banks in one form or the other follow something like a Taylor Rule, whether they are explicit or implicit about it. And it's named after him. And here's the interesting thing. I was thinking about this and getting ready for the show, Claudia. You're about a decade, okay, 12 years at the Fed. I'll say a decade approximately and you got a rule named after you. <laughs> John Taylor started, I looked this up, 73. Mm-hmm. His paper where the Taylor rule comes out is 93. So that's mm. two decades. And, and it probably took a few years after that article. So it took him two decades, took you about one decade. So you, you really have kind of like <laughs> set a pace. It's going to be hard to match for anybody else in the future. So you have a rule named after you. You've done it at a blazing pace. Uh, this rule now is on Haber, it's on Bloomberg. And Haber is a place you can get your data. Bloomberg, same thing. Fred, all these data sources have the Psalm rule. So are you like pinching yourself when you go under Fred or Bloomberg and you see this rule named after yourself? Yes. That's pretty uh, and amazing. It, it was a surprise to me. Uh, I didn't think it was a recession indicator in the book. Uh, so you don't call it Psalm rule in the book? Well, right? I no, I uh, absolutely not. And they <laughs> blindsided me. So Recession Ready was a co-sponsored volume between the Hamilton Project at Brookings yeah. and Equitable Growth. So the future, you know, the employer now. Uh, and the whole book, and I really would recommend it to people who are interested in economic policy and macroeconomic stabilization. So fighting recessions. Uh, every chapter was on a different automatic stabilizer. Some of them exist right now, like unemployment insurance, yep. like extended benefits, how to strengthen those automatic stabilizers. And my chapter, and there was another one on infrastructure, was taking a fiscal stimulus policy that's often turned on in recessions and making it automatic. So with the case, I was looking at direct payments to individuals. So these have happened. So in 2001, there was a tax rebate. In 2008, there was a stimulus, economic stimulus yeah, so payment. Yes, checks we got. From- right. There were checks, electronic funds transfer. There were there was money that went out to households in yep. chunks, like $1,000. 2001 was like 500 2008 was 1000 But it was, was kind 1, of 000. ad hoc. Is your well, point. and so they were what we call discretionary. discretionary. So there was a past precedent of it, but there was legislation drafted on the Hill when it was clear the economy was having some trouble, and then it had to pass Congress. So often in fighting recessions, everybody gets on board. This is not – especially when a recession starts, this is not typically a time of partisan bickering. And But it takes time. It takes time to draft legislation. It takes time to get it through Congress. And one of the things – and seriously, the public servants at the Internal Revenue Service and Social Security Administration should have gotten a medal for how quickly they were actually able to do the logistics. So my proposal – was to make these automatic. To make something automatic, you have to have a trigger that says right. now it goes. And and this could all be agreed in legislation before when we're not in a recession. There's actually been a lot of interest recently in maybe we could do this. I don't – well, 
maybe we could. Or there's a whole volume now that you could pull off the shelf when it does look like a recession and get going on legislation. And my proposal, I think it's really important. Another aspect of the automatic is you would give time for the logistics to be put together. The government actually does not have, and this may be a good thing, like the address, the bank account of every American Right. So they had to pull. I mean, the IRS has information because they do the tax returns. That's, you know, uh, timely. Right. So security, the 2008 went out to retirees, people who didn't have a tax liability. So security administration, they cut checks. They know where people are. You had to have collaboration. You can only um, push out so many checks like the government can only cut so many checks in a week. So there were just all kinds of logistic things. And in my chapter, and I talk about this, we could we could get this ready. If you had a system in place, it wouldn't be a mad dash. You could turn them out during tax season, which was impossible in 2008. In any case, I think there's a lot to be gained. And I drew on the research that I've done on fiscal stimulus since 2008. I studied the 2008 tax payments or the the stimulus payments, making work pay, which was tax credits that went out over time, uh, and then the payroll tax cut. And I had to follow this literature because this was this was stuff we put in the forecast. So I had learned a lot, had a lot of opinions about how to do stimulus. And really, that was the core of my chapter. That was what I thought I was writing the chapter for. But of course, you need this trigger. So and I kind of knew this would work from the beginning. I spent many a Saturday morning fiddling with this thing. I eventually pulled the real time data. So data that was available at the time, right. because that's a much more legitimate test uh, and when I presented it the first time at an author's conference that was either late January, early February, and Jay Shambo, who'd been the member I worked for a previous when I was the at show. the Council of Economic Advisors. Oh, yes, Jay is great. He's like, Clyde, this is good. Because he'd worked on something in early 2016 when the economy okay. wasn't looking so hot. So he was at the council. And so he had kind of fiddled around. And even Jason uh, Furman, who was the chair, then he's like a half a percentage point. This is bad. And But I knew this from working at the Fed. Like if the unemployment rate rises well, a small amount, this is not a good sign. Tell us the trigger. I mean, we're, talk, we're kind of walking oh, yes. around it. What, what actually is the SOM rule and what is the trigger amount? Okay. So what I do is I take the monthly unemployment rate. I calculate the three-month average. So the current rate and the two prior. Yeah. Why I do that is monthly data. Any monthly data is noisy. So you don't want to like overreact a little, you know, ups and downs. So take the three month average and then I look at the current month and I compare it to the low of that same series over the prior 12 months. Okay. So I take 13 months of data, this comparison. If the difference is a half a percentage point or more, we're in a recession. So this is not a forecasting device. This is an indicator that says we're in a recession and we're early in it. So it like triggers two to four months. Yeah. Uh, and this is helpful because at that moment in a recession, we don't know we're in a recession. Because there is a – at the National Bureau of Economic Research, there is a recession dating committee, which is not a fun-sounding dating committee. This is a group that uh, sits down, very senior economists who work in macroeconomics, I think largely or all academics. I don't think there's any government – Economists. Uh, and what they do at that time, and this is, uh, they do not call recessions until 12 months more right. afterwards. And, and at that point, they have a whole host of data that they look at, including the unemployment rate, and they will choose the month in which the recession started, and then they will later choose the month in which it ended. This is important news, but 12 months into a recession, this I mean, we should still be doing stimulus, but this is not the first time you want to push something out to the economy. And so that you can't wait for the dating committee. You also there's a very common belief, which has some basis to it, that two months of negative GDP growth is a recession. Okay, so there's a problem with using that also as an early recession indicator because GDP growth that's quarterly. It takes time. It gets revised. I mean, it, when you've got two months of negative GDP growth, you're also well into it. I was going to say, yeah, it's quite a delay, six months. I mean, that's... That's a tough one. The thing that really caught attention, there were a few things that caught attention. One, there are no false positives. So since the 1970s, like when it turns on, we're it's in a always recession. Worked. It's yes. always worked. There is a case after the 1975 recession where it kicks back on. But in my proposal, that's one of the big recessions. And 
I not only have a stimulus payment go out at the beginning of the recession, if it's a big one in 75, 2008, obviously, I think 81 or something like that, they were all big. They had more than a two percentage point increase yep. in the unemployment rate in the first year. This is a bad, bad. So for those, I said, okay, once that happens, you're going to send out a check every single year until the unemployment rate comes down not to its pre-recession level, but gets a lot closer. So for me, like my policy, we were still in the like, cutting checks when this thing kind of went a little bit above 0.5. In any case, no false positives. And the other thing, and this actually was a design principle, and I thought this was important. I talk about it in the chapter. It is so simple. is the unemployment rate. That is the That's most true. followed national indicator, and it matters. Like, to me, that is the core of why a recession is so bad, is because people lose their jobs. That is really a problem. In the recession, many households do not have a lot of money sitting by the side and certainly not to cover months of pay. So it's bad in recessions, and there is a lot of research that shows this. If you lose your job in a recession, it takes a long time and maybe ha even has a career negative effect. So to me, like, the unemployment rate – is just where it's at in terms of thinking about a recession. It's easy to calculate. It's a monthly series. It comes out very soon after the month is done. And frankly, I think the transparency is important. Yeah, and I think what makes this appealing, probably on both sides of the aisle, is what you're proposing, at least in the way I see it, is, is an, a plan that makes it systematic, makes it rules-based, makes it predictable. And of course, the, the, the goal would be to actually do it now, you know, get Congress to maybe legislate this now. So as you head into a recession, you're prepared. And in fact, I would argue if you have a rule like this in place, it might actually reduce the severity of a future mm -hmm. recession, just the anticipation that there's going to be that backstop. Mm -hmm. People will be less likely to panic, to hoard mm -hmm. funds, to save more, come back on spending. So on many levels, just the preparation, the, the mental, you know, psyche part that would be useful so I talked to your to your now current boss Heather Boucher about this. We inter we interviewed her about the book, and and she agreed that one of the things we we want to you want to do is to get these ideas kind of in play now ahead of time, systematic because we know what will happen. What will happen is Congress will do something, and I think particularly so now that interest rates are getting low. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve. My worry is the Federal Reserve is going to be very limited in the next few recessions. In fact, the minutes from the past few uh, FOMC meetings. The staff forecasts have the Fed facing the effective lower bound, zero. They can't cut their rates. Mm -hmm. And it looks like long-term rates are going down as well. So the Fed, I think, will be kind of limited in what it can do with conventional tools. So what you're proposing is a predictable, systematic way of, of addressing it instead of having Congress make things up on the run mm -hmm. and hoping it works. So I, I hope they take it seriously. They think about it. They're proactive. With all that said, though, I want to go back. How did the name come about? So you have this great idea, this great trigger. So, so yeah, the, the Psalm rule, the now famous Psalm rule is about the trigger, not the, the whole package. You have a package, mm -hmm. how it works. I think that's the point you're making. But let's, let's just play this up. I mean, it's a rule named after you. So, so who called it the Psalm rule? Was it Jay Shamba that called it the Psalm rule or someone else? So I haven't. I've gotten some of the history from Jay, uh, but again, they totally blindsided me at the launch event in May. Okay. Uh, I was going to be a panel in the middle. Karen Dynan was going to talk to me about the book. Everyone else who had a chapter, there were two other panels. They opened the event with kind of a fireside chat with Christy Romer and Ben Bernanke because like, they were very yep. key players. Christy was the head of CEA and Ben was obviously the Fed chair. Uh, and even in that talk that first one the psalm rule came up somewhere in there and then it started and okay, i'm like sitting there and i'm rule. like what's <laughs> happening and jay told me later that they actually had been calling it internally the claudia rule but then they decided before the launch event they had to get it a little more serious one you know syllable <laughs> when to tie it to my last name which is yeah, more yeah. unique than claudia Anyway, so I'm sitting there, and they also know I'm not the kind of person that would have named it after myself. So it was yep. kind of fun, I think, to watch me want to crawl under my chair. Uh, and But after the event, Christy Romer, I was talking to her for various reasons related to my proposal and some of the comments she made in the panel. That was all recorded. I think it's a really nice event, especially that beginning to listen to. 
Uh, and after the event, I said to her, oh, the Psalm rule. And she looked at me and she's like, Claudia, you have got to own this. Any man economist would own this. this and I true. was like, this is true. I've never <laughs> heard John Taylor push back on the Taylor rule. So I've tried really hard. I have gotten pushback. I've gotten pushback really? from the staff. I can come back to that, the Fed. But what's hilarious, and this is, I think everyone should have an ego check. Having a, having a teenage daughter is an excellent ego check. So she said a few things. When it came out the first time and it was getting some attention, she was like, Mom, that's dad's name, not your name. So we're co-parents Ooh. now. But I kept her because I was like, well, child, I kept it because I like to have your last name. And anyways, so then <laughs> like two or three weeks ago when it got more coverage, yeah. I think this was when the Wall Street Journal article came out. We were driving home in the car and she looked at me and she's like, Mom, are you worried that you've peaked? With the Psalm rule. Wow. And I was like, wow, child. Later she was like, well, it was a question. And I was like, still. But I looked at her and I told her, I said, you know, I aspire not to be a one trick pony. But if this is the only trick I've got, like this is, (laughs) I am proud of this one. So yeah, teenagers are great. The ego is in check. Uh, I still am amazed at the reception. I was amazed at the reception at the event, we had a discussion before with a lot of the contributors and a gentleman who has worked for decades in economic policy in D.C., not monetary, but a mm-hmm. lot of advising on fiscal policy at a research think tank. And he told me, he's like, when I heard about your rule, this like five, you know, half a percentage point increase, he's like, I didn't be- there was like no way that can work. And he's like, then I saw it, it does. So that was a clue to me that something I knew that would work. I mean, I didn't know exactly what the the formula would have to be, but I knew it was going to work. And I had people with a lot of experience in policy, like I had no idea. So I was like, okay. And that's why it's gotten the reception. That's why it's in these three databases. And like you said, I don't expect the automatic stabilizer policy to go into place before. I don't expect this to happen now, but people are following the SOM rule. So there'll be an awareness when the economy is starting to have trouble. I I had a an individual who works in the Ohio government who said they are thinking about using it to tie some of their safety net. Oh, really? And I was I was just floored. So now the reason there was a Wall Street Journal article that in the headline, Kate Davidson wrote this. Whoever is her editor, I want to send a thank you note to because like the headline was amazing. But the end of the headline was as. The experts agree, ask Claudia Somm. Okay, this ran. I got a lot of emails at work about this. Fantastic. I am sure that if those experts were 80% Fed economists, former Fed economists, there's no way if you ask them they would say Claudia Somm. So, which is fine. Again, remember, I thought it was obvious. Uh, I never worked on the labor forecast at the Fed. I did. Andrew Figueroa was my first group manager. His research is in labor. After this event and the stop when I was like, oh, people are paying attention to this. So I asked him, I was like, Andrew, did I scoop the inside Fed rule? Because I know there's this increases. And he's like, no, Claudia. He's like, our go-to is a three-tenths increase. So you, I was like, thank goodness I didn't scoop. And at that point, it wouldn't have been the SOM rule. If I had scooped it, it was going to be like the Fed rule or something. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like, okay. Now, at that point, I knew three-tenths has false positives. I mean, I'd spent enough time with that spreadsheet, and I know where at least one of them is at. And so I was like, okay. But it did, like, small increase. And I'm like, that's fine. You yeah. do that. And I remember at the time in the press, and I think even someone had mentioned to me on a deep background call with the journalists, uh, that he said, well, Bill Dudley has a three-tenths rule. So, like, yours isn't special. And I was like, eh, okay, nice person. He didn't write an article about me. Uh, and uh, I actually got an email from Bill Dudley this la- my like a week or two ago. And uh, the subject line of the email was, for what it's worth, here's my three-tenths rule. And it, I put it in a Goldman Sachs newsletter in 2000. 2000, 2001. And he did a little screenshot of the Goldman thing, highlighted the sentence he'd written. And then there was a table, a table, not a chart of like how it worked in recession. I didn't reply to him. I don't plan to. This is an opportunity uh, to the world to reply to him. And it really encapsulated a lot of things that I had trouble with at the Fed and are part of why I feel pretty good about having left the Fed. Uh, one, I mean, I really don't appreciate this. Like you're doing a good job. I'm going to undercut your work, but yeah. whatever. That's an ego thing. 
And not saying he has an ego, but I mean, I've seen this pattern before, so whatever. Um, and okay, I know I have no false positives, right? So, and I know Whereas his three tens does, does. Have, yeah. you know, but it's a good rule. Like in principle, there's a lot of shared principles. So fine. The piece I had the most problem with was telling me it was in a Goldman Sachs newsletter. And I'm like, private sector, macro people, they are important. They are great. It is important the financial sector yep. knows what the heck is going on in the economy. But that gentleman who works in the Ohio State go- or in the Ohio government, he doesn't. I would lay good money that he does not get the Goldman right. Sachs newsletter. Right. I got attention because people didn't know about it outside the Fed or outside of the places Fed bank presidents and Fed staff go to work. So I understand that, and there's a lot of examples. That's a great point, though. In that- the Fed. That you know, few people have access to those newsletters from mm-hmm. Wall Street, and um, you're you're kind of like breaking, tearing down that veil. Mm-hmm. You're ripping the veil that you know everyone now has access to the truth. So, great, great stories mm-hmm. and great rule. We could talk a lot more about this, but it's in the book Recession Ready. We'll provide a link to it in your article on the webpage for the podcast. Okay, so some rules great. Um, again, kudos to you for not just having a rule named after you, but a, a, a practical rule that can make the world a better place if it is paid attention to along with your proposal that goes with it. But I want to move on to something else you've done. You're not, Mm -hmm. you, you talked about being a one trick pony, but that's not, that's not, (laughs) you're you're being very harsh on yourself because you've done some interesting work with some colleagues at the Fed, I believe. Mm -hmm. And this is using big data to inform policymaking. So I believe the paper you have, an MBR working paper, and you have a bunch of notes that surrounds us. It's not the only thing, but I think your big paper, correct me if I'm wrong, is from transaction data to economic statistics, constructing real-time, high-frequency, geographic measures of consumer spending. And that, that paper constructs kind of a real-time um, measure of economic activity spending, I believe, based on credit cards and transactions. So talk us through that and how would it be useful for policy? How would it be useful for the FOMC meetings, for example? Yeah. So the working paper, which is a little bit of a mouthful with its title, so that's our methods paper, it will appear, it's forthcoming in the MBR has a volume called Big Data for the 21st Century. And that volume has, we're contributing to that, another flagship uh, big data project at the board using ADP data, so looking at labor market. It has a chapter, many different government agencies, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Economic Analysis, many of them have these big data where they're taking private company data that was not intended to be an economic statistic, and they're transforming it into something that can be used potentially in official statistics. And in our case, our statistics are developed primarily for internal use. Like we're years away from publishing these on. Yeah. I mean, the Fed publishes economic statistics. We might get there, but not yet. So what this project is, and I've been working with an amazing team on this. So Adi Aladangadi, Shifra Arendine. She was actually a research assistant at the time and now is at Stanford for her PhD. Uh, Wendy Dunn, Laura Fiveson, Paul Langerman, and myself. That basically makes up the consumption analyst researcher group at the Fed. Uh and we put aside a lot of our research time over the last three years to pour ourselves into this data. As you note, there are several Fed's notes. This is, you know, we needed some yeah. output. And we also needed it. I mean, those Fed's notes have a corollary of inside research, most of them. We also needed to do that to show these data can be used in policy settings. And the chapter has a lot more details on how we construct these. We use this economic census to make sure that there's a representativeness to our data. And that's really important for policy work. Like the numbers matter, not just the sign. So we did a lot of work. We partnered. I mean, First Data gets a lot of credit for being willing to share their payment data. We did it in a very credit card and debit card transaction. It's basically any card swipe. Okay. So first data, they partner with merchants, you know, those little machines you have to stick your card in. Yep. Mm-hmm. Many of them, not all of them, are first data merchants or partners. So we get card swipes. We get credit cards, debit cards. We get electronic benefit transfer cards. And so we have all this data, massive amount of data. First data is a large payment processor. And they had partnered 
with Palantir as their technology partner. So Palantir, for just first data's use, was doing things with the data so they could make judgments about their private, you know, their business model. So we worked with Palantir. We had an amazing programmer, Dan Moulton, who was the lead there in helping us transform the data. We worked with a lot of Palantir staff over time, and we got it to a good place. So as two examples where this has been used, the first was in 2017, we used the data to do real-time tracking of Hurricane Irma and Harvey for the FOMC. I was writing Teal Book at the time. So I guess Harvey was first. I was writing Teal Book, which is our big forecast document that goes to the FOMC. And we had a section we added to that about the hurricanes. The data are extremely granular. They're daily data. They're geographically and they're specific. And measuring transactions. Well, and what we do, the transactions are the underlying data. After a lot of filtering, yeah. we create series that are comparable to the retail sales data that comes out of census. Okay. And we bench, we like not, we didn't benchmark to them, but we were doing our comparisons to see how good the data were. We'd go to the place where there's overlap. So census, it's national, it's monthly. We spent a lot of time on seasonal adjustment. Um, but then once we were comfortable with that, then we would use the granularity in our first data series. The fact that it's daily, it has geographic specificity, and we get that data within two days, three days. So – Amazing. Yeah, no, it's is totally amazing. So when I'm working on this, writing it up, I mean, it's so exciting. Like I've never we study weather a lot, uh, and uh, I'd never been able to do it in real time, and I'd never been able to do it in real time for the FOMC. I will say, and this is the power of these data, and I really wish everybody, particularly outside of the government, thought harder about what the ethics are of these data, is I can remember sitting at home, revising the draft on my computer, and I had the New York Times, I flipped over to it online, and it was the story about the woman who they found like floating through some drainage ditch holding her baby above her, like the woman had drowned and the baby was alive. And I was like, I'm sitting here so excited about these data. And people, while I'm writing this up, are in a really bad place. And we were actually instructed by David Wilcox, who was the division director at the time, that what we wrote up had to be sensitive. Like it could not, just in general, how we were talking about the hurricane. We did that. So it's really powerful data. And, you know, it's, and this is, I guess, where I, I, I see great opportunity here. So Sounds like it. This real time data is, has already been fed into FOMC. Meetings. There's another really good example. Okay. So in this, this was this year in 2019. There was a federal government shutdown. That shutdown affected census, so they could not publish retail sales when they normally would. And even after the shutdown ended, they were delayed on their publishing because their source data and getting a survey. And they were just everything got thrown off. We had the first data. This was a time where the economy was being a little yeah. uncertain, and we were able to give that to the FOMC. They had no other date. Well, they didn't have the official statistics. We look at a lot of data. So there's other stuff we could look yeah. at. The official statistics are the best thing we have. And if they're not there, there's a little bit – I don't want to say flying blind because that's – I don't yeah. want to scare anybody. But <laughs> it was really helpful to have those data, and we we didn't have that in the last shutdown. Yeah. So we had that, and it was like, wow. And that that is detailed in our working paper. So I don't want to – nobody thinking I'm leaking stuff here. Uh, but that, that shows how powerful those data are. I do want to close with one point. Partnering with private companies can be difficult because they're there to, my, like, do profits. Totally important. I'm an economist. Yay, profit maximization. In the government putting these statistics together, we're trying to create public goods, those are not the same thing. Yeah. Partnerships happen because somebody in the company gets it. Like we've got information this can help the world. People change in companies. The cost of it is actually realized. And then those partnerships fall apart. I don't know of a single big data effort within the consumption space. And these are academics and go that hasn't shut down at some point because it just like the match gets lost. So – we are in a position where we are not going to have access to these data, at least near term. So we're working on it, but we've had to rejigger and okay. we're well, high maintenance. And uh, Well, I, I guess my couple thoughts on this big kind of takeaway. I, to me, it, it's 
kind of surprising that we still use data based on survey. It's kind of this, I know the traditional data after several revisions is good, but to make policy making in the 21st century, it seems like big data would be the first thing we turn to. I mean, I understand it's still being developed. There's all kinds of seasonality. There's different types of activity being mm-hmm. done. There's a lot of issues to work through, but I would think this is something we would do like already. I've heard many stories of like hedge funds who use this type mm-hmm. of data, the trans credit card transaction, debit card transaction. I've heard of you know satellite lay satellite pictures to measure economic activity. So you know, m- my hope is that at some point policymakers will get to the point where that's kind of like their first data they have. It's real time. They can see what's going on. And you're making a valiant effort to, to get us there. But it sounds like there may be some bumps along the road. Which leads me to the second point I would make is, and again, this is you know an outsider mm-hmm. looking in. Yeah. You can correct me here, but the Federal Reserve has a a budget, and it seems to me if they really wanted the data, they could find the funds to to make this a more reliable source of information. They could pay partners to get this anonymized information in. I mean, they remit a lot of money back to Treasury. They could take some of that and pay a vendor to regularly. Send the state. I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase has its big data set. I think a sixty-four million, fourteen mm-hmm. different metro yeah. areas. I mean, getting a partner with someone like them or the, this this vendor you mentioned earlier. Um, I think that's essential. It's useful. It, it's putting the government into the twenty-first century and how it makes decisions. Any thoughts? So I'll start with your second point, but I do want to come back to the first because yeah. I I disagree with you on the first. So we do pay. First data and Palantir for okay. the data and is not trivial. I mean, this is amazing data. So, I mean, we should, you know, get to the value, the marginal product. Money is, well, money can be enough, but there are constraints on the Fed's data budget. And it's a large, but I mean, we buy a lot of data yep. because data is important. All kinds of data. So actually, I will come back to your first point. Like, I love all data. A lot of my research is using survey data where you just ask households directly, what would you do with the stimulus, more or yeah. less? The official statistics are so important. So like retail sales where it's a firm survey, those mm-hmm. are really important. The economic census, uh, well, some many of those surveys to firms are mandatory reporting. That's important. Okay, uh, they have to give that data. I love big data. I love this idea of taking information that's just being kicked off by the process of doing business. I think that we should try to combine the data and use each to its like its comparative advantage. So that's I think that's a lot of what we see right now in the landscape. I do agree the big data needs to be more developed, needs to be more integrated in official statistics where it's more helpful than the survey. So I'm all on board with like an integration. I just I'm not sure I think it'll be a long time before the weight falls more on the big data. Okay. But you know, we'll see. Fair enough. And and I know there are some big concerns also with using big data. So even if you had this world that I'm dreaming mm-hmm. of here, yeah. the problem is you're measuring like nominal transactions. You're not measuring value added. I mean, r- real GDP is value added. It's mm-hmm. final sales. And we're looking at total activity. So there, there's some well, and there, problems. Well, there are projects. So there's a project... Uh, in the opening of this volume that looks at price data, right? So there's an understanding we need prices, that each of the chapters is focusing on a different sector of the economy. So there's like this effort going on. I did want to say one more thing on your second point. So I uh, was on a panel at the National Association of Bureau Economics. They have a tech conference that was in Seattle. This was recently. David Wessel organized a panel on using private data for economic statistics, so I was invited to be on the yeah. panel. And and I talked about this. Our biggest challenge right now is getting these partnerships figured out. It is not a technical problem. We do figure out how to create the statistics. It's just official statistics or, frankly, the Fed. We can't rely on stuff that, like, we think it's there and then it's not. And then there's this holdup problem because you yeah. double our – anyway, so – it was uh, – so we gave this talk and I was kind of grumpy because I – but I told him, I was like, hey, I'm a <laughs> macroeconomist. You're getting grump. And I also said, you know, this mismatch in goals, I said, it is not my life dream to teach private companies how to monetize their data because we're basically helping them create data sets that they can sell to Goldman. They can sell to Wall Street. But – their goal is not to create public good. So I get it. Like this is – we just have different right. incentives and we can find partnerships that work. Like I'm really happy with First Data, like what they have 
um, given us an opportunity to do. Okay, so then it gets the question and answer, and because it's like a tech conference, they come up on the iPad to yeah. David Wessel, and someone from the audience is like, well, why doesn't the Fed just tell the companies that they have to give them the data? I was like, yeah, I'm on the West Coast. You all don't think too hard about, like, burden. <laughs> I was like, that would be such a non-starter and get the Fed in a lot of trouble. But it could be that we work, you know, maybe industry groups come together and pool data. And maybe there's a way to take the data and give it back to the companies in a way that's helpful for them. Yeah. So I have hope, but these are not simple answers. Well, I wonder, you know, the Office of Financial Research, mm -hmm. that's part of you know, Dodd-Frank, that's with FSOC. I wonder if they could play a role in this somewhere. Well, in one of our earlier big data projects, and this we've done several, and this is the first one yeah. that like worked. I mean, we learned a lot from the failures, so I think that was good. We had one project where we were using the Y14 data, and that's data that after Dodd-Frank, the Federal Reserve had the authority to collect. And it's also granular. It's like banks reporting, monthly yep. account balances. It probably gets a lot closer to what J.P. Morgan Chase has for data, except it's more of a universe. Again, it's collected for supervisory purposes. It is not collected to create a twin to retail sales. So there is regulatory data. And, and the agencies, they're working with administrative data to do their big data project. There's a lot of issues about sharing data even within the government. Like IRS data doesn't go to a lot of other people for very good reasons. Right. But it can be very helpful as an administrative source for, right. say, income. So it's a really exciting area. I am so blessed to have gotten to work on this. And the Federal Reserve, like this, this is an important mission that they have. And there's multiple projects going and they're putting the resources Okay, so they're working it. on this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this yeah so I mean, you know, I guess my, my dream would be to make this concrete and clear as possible is one day mm -hmm. we'll have something similar to the billion price project at MIT where you, you know, they, they're scraping data off the internet and they have this index of billing prices, I guess, and they, they construct an index a whole lot like the CPI, but it's real time. So one day we'll have the billion transaction yeah, <laughs> index you know. along those lines. And I, th I think it's, it's hugely important because I, I think back to 2008, when you know, GDP was coming out in the second half of the year, we were in a steep fall, the economy, but the GDP data didn't show it until it was revised the next year. So you needed some kind of other indicator to, to you know push the Fed a little harder to move maybe more aggressively. But with that said, you've been on the front end of this effort and you've done a lot of work and we appreciate what you're doing and you continue to do. And um, we'll look forward to more progress on this. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest has been Claudia Sam. Claudia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.